Hi, my name is Michael Bocciolieri and I'm with the Loophole Optics Academy. And what we're going to go through today is some basics of how to mount an optic onto a weapon system so that it's perfect for you, your body structure, the way you address that rifle, and a versatile setup for whatever situation you might find yourself in using that weapon system. This is normally about a 45 minute seminar that we put on. Today we're going to abbreviate it a little bit. We're going to shorten it up to try and get it to you with some real serious basics that will hopefully help you out. The first thing that you need to do when you're setting up this rifle is get your rings in place. Now this is a one piece uh, setup like a, an integral mounting system versus two independent rings, but it works the same with both. And when you have two rings, what you really want to do is figure out where you can set those rings up and have some movement with this scope initially so that you can set it up to the end user. So for this one, I don't have a choice. I actually take up the entire rail when I set this on there. I choose to put my keeper nuts right here that keep the keepers tight and snug and torqued down. I choose on a bolt action rifle to have those on the non-firing side. And the reason for that is all of my manipulation of this gun is on the right hand side and it's just less to clutter the area. The thing to remember is when you put these rings down and you put the, the cross slots into the Picatinny cross slot uh, slots, you push it all the way forward Make sure that you're pressed forward as far as you can up against the abutments towards the muzzle end of the gun. The reason for that is as you pull the trigger, this weapon system is going to want to try to come out from underneath the scope. And if this is already pushed forward, it's got no place to go and you will have a better chance of retaining your zero. So we're going to tighten these up and these particular keepers get tightened up to 65 inch pounds. So I'm going to push it forward and make sure it's where I need it to be. And then I'm going to cam this over and make sure that we're at a full 65 inch pounds so that I don't have to worry about it moving forward. Now, if you end up using a C-conk or one of the T-handle style torque wrenches, it's a great tool. I carry one in my bag. I've got one all the time. The problem is, is as you torque it over, there's enough spring tension and backlash of that torque wrench that as you pop it, it will actually loosen the keeper from its torque, dropping your torque significantly down. So if you choose to use a C-conk or you carry one with you like I do, make sure once you cam over, you stop before it pops and then grab the the uh, socket with a Leatherman tool, pop it over so you don't lose calibration, but don't allow it to pop. Just stop after it cams. So the next thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna get a shooter behind this gun. And we're gonna get the shooter behind the gun with no scope in the rings. And the reason for that is I've found as we're going through this, if there's a scope there that the shooter can start to see while he's behind the gun, a lot of shooters will auto adjust subconsciously so that they can see through the scope. You want this scope to work for you, not you working for the scope. What we want is we want the shooter in a proper body alignment position behind the rifle, and then we shift the scope into where they need it to be, not having them shift to the scope. So once they're back there, the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna start to adjust this cheek piece height. Once we get this in there, we're gonna see some vignetting, some of that scope shadow. And at this point, it doesn't really matter. A lot of times you'll be too close or too far from the scope, so the vignetting you see will be a big giant ring, a big black ring all the way around. That's fine. We're working on the cheek height here, or left to right, or canting it. But what we need is we just need the hole that they're seeing through concentric to the housing of the scope. So all that black vignetting at this moment is irrelevant. We just need it to be centered out. No problem. Once we figure that out, now we know that we've got them at the right cheek height. Now we're gonna work on movement forward to back. So what we do is we take the scope, we put it on max magnification. The reason why we put it on max magnification is that's gonna bring our eye box all the way forward. Now if we're in a standing offhand position, that body position will take our head and put it in the furthest geometrical relationship to the scope. As we get into a supported position, whether that's prone, seated, kneeling, anything of that nature, our head starts to get a lot closer to that scope. And usually when we're in a supported position, that's when we go up to higher magnifications. And that's when that eye box slides forward and we need our eye box and eye relief to be here as opposed to back here. So now they're in the prone, now they're in a supported position. We're gonna put the optic on max magnification. From there, I'm gonna help this shooter. They're gonna be behind the rifle and I'm gonna start sliding this scope forward. And it's gonna go from a full scope of light and start to collapse in as they hit the back end of that eye box. So as soon as that vignetting or that scope shadow starts to creep in, they need to tell me to stop. I'm gonna back the scope up. As soon as it goes away, then they're gonna tell me to stop again. At that point in time, I'm gonna move the scope back another eighth to quarter of an inch, and that's where I'm gonna lock the scope down at. All right, so once I have my alignment all set up, I'm getting ready to level the scope. The shooter can get out from behind the scope. I know exactly where I need that optic to be in a linear fashion, forward to back, as well as get the cheek height set up. We're all set up here now. And because this is my weapon system, normally I would mark this. 
either with a fingernail groove here, putting a piece of tape there, a paint pen, something of that nature. Because this is my system, I know right where this crease, transitioning from the objective bell over to the main tube, I know exactly where that sits. So I actually don't need to mark this system. From here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna level out the rifle. I'm gonna start by putting my level on either the base that's there or on the, the flat of the IMS mount or the integral mounting system that I have here. At this point, I'm gonna set up my clamp on top of the barrel so that I can match these up. Once I start clamping this down, I just need to more or less get it centered. I don't need it to be exact because there's a, there's a micro adjustment point on top of this level. When I level these, you always have two lines in a level. And on those two lines, I always take the bubble level and make sure it's up against one side. Temperatures, temperature differentials can make that bubble level grow or shrink in size, giving you more or less of a gap between your reference lines on that level. So I always put it up against one line. So I've got this up against the weak side or the non-firing side line. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna micro adjust this level over here. So they're perfectly matched up. Once I've got them set, I can remove this, I can move the weapon system around, manipulate whatever I need to back here, and not worry about losing level on my gun because that's actually clamped onto the barrel. There's several level systems out there that are good, but they're good for a certain make and model of rifle. The beauty of this system is I can, I can clamp this up. This is a bat machine action. I can clamp this up on a stock Remington, Winchester, Saco, Savage, doesn't matter what it is. I can get this set up and it will work for me regardless of the, of the manufacturer or model of my rifle. So from here, I've got my torque wrench. I've reset that at 28 inch pounds and I'm gonna take my optic and put it right where it needs to be, referencing the mark that I put on there, i.e. fingernail mark, paint pen mark, whatever it is, I'm gonna get it right back into position. From here, I'm gonna take my elevation dial completely off. And the reason why I'm taking this off is because I wanna utilize the actual adjustment that's connected to the erector tube inside of the scope because that will move perfectly perpendicular to that erector system while this has the ability to toggle back and forth and be slightly out of level because because of two screws set screws it's clamped to the actual adjustment we have the opportunity to use the actual adjustment so there's no reason not to so at this point we need to make sure that this level here is very perpendicular to the actual scope main tube. If I touch that and make it go diagonal, it will change the setting of the bubble level, giving me a false positive or a false negative. So I'm gonna get this set up, make sure that it's exactly where I need it to be and matches my front bubble. Once I'm here, I'm gonna install my first scope ring. Now, some folks out there will work on both scope rings caps at the same time. They'll start here, bounce there, toggle back and forth. You're not necessarily doing anything wrong by doing that, but you are wasting time. And why I say you're wasting time is because as I start to clamp this down and tighten these fasteners up, it's gonna grab that main tube and wanna rotate the scope. And you'll see the bubble level go back and forth, back and forth. By working with two scope ring caps at the same time, I'm fighting a lot more of this movement that's going on with more moving parts. Once I focus on one single scope ring cap, lock that one down, this one will no longer move the scope as it's tightening down, saves me time and saves me a headache. So I'm gonna put this back on there, right where I need it to be, make sure that it's perpendicular. And I'm gonna get my bubble levels lined up and matching. Once I'm here, I'm gonna actually start with a T15 driver. I'm not even gonna to jump to the torque wrench yet. I can drop this in, and I'm, what I'm wanting here on these scope ring caps is equal distance between the two. That way I know I've tightened it down with equal pressure coming all the way around the main tube. So I'm gonna put pressure on this side and I'm gonna to start to tighten down the opposite side and I'm gonna watch the gaps and make sure that they equalize as I start to tighten that down. At this point, my scope is still loose. I have not tightened it down in any way yet and I can still rotate it and make sure that we're, our levels are matched. Now with the screws fast, or the fasteners uh, tightened up and snugged up, I can start doing cross slot tightening here, just like you would the wheel of a car. Make sure I snug that one up, come over to the opposite side and kind of do a star pattern all the way through this scope ring cap until I get to a certain level and they're all snugged up and then I'm gonna to switch to my torque wrench. From here, once I move to my torque wrench, I'm not just gonna take the torque wrench and turn it until it pops. I'm gonna do a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, continuing that star pattern until the torque wrench decides it's time to cam over. That one popped there, that one popped, 
and now it's time. I'm gonna continue through this sequence because as I go to the opposite side and tighten it up, what ends up happening is pressure is equalized and oftentimes you can still get some more rotation out of there. Once I go through the entire sequence where things aren't actually turning anymore, they're just popping with the torque wrench cam over, then I'm gonna recheck exactly where I'm at here, make sure that we're both exactly on the line. I can remove this and move to my other scope ring cap. Once I'm here on this scope ring cap, I go through the exact same sequence. I put pressure on one side, tighten down the other side until the gaps equalize, and then continue tightening up the rest of the scope ring cap. Once they're all snugged up, heading over to the torque wrench. making sure all screws are complete at our torque yield. As you pull new scope rings out of the package, oftentimes you're gonna see a little bit of a blue gob on the threads. And most people assume that that's Loctite. It's actually a substance called Nylock. Now Nylock is a great thread lock compound. The problem is, is it acts as a friction application, not a lubricant. And tor uh, turning in screws on scope ring caps is no different than anything from a cylinder head to anything major that you're doing. The last thing you do before you install a cylinder head, a cylinder head on an engine is you lube the threads of the cylinder head bolts. Same thing here. That allows those threads to move within each other with no resistance, allowing you to get inside of that elasticity window of that fa fastener and make sure that you have a full clamp load when you torque it. That's what you're looking to do here. So if you pull a new set of rings out and they've got that blue nylock glob on top of the threads, you need to screw those screws in and out three to four times maybe, and make sure that you break all that nylock up. Now it will act as a lubricant and it will be a great thread locker to use. All right, looking back at what we've done here, we've got the scope all set up. At this point, we are ready to find our elevation dial, put it back on there. We can snug this up and make sure that it's back at its position of zero. Going over what we just did, why we mounted the scope in the position that we did, why we had the shooter get behind the weapon system in the prone, is so that we could figure out exactly where their head placement was and put that eye box right where they needed it to be on max magnification in the prone when the eye box was shifted all the way forward. In doing that, when that shooter gets up and is moving with that weapon system, takes the optics and moves them down to the minimum magnification, shifting that eye box all the way to the rearmost position. Now, if that individual has a chance contact and has to engage with a standing offhand shot, that eye box will be right where they need it to be. Conversely, if they're moving, they're on minimum magnification, they spot a target at some distance, put their body and set everything up into a supported shooting position, now their head will be closer to the, the ocular lens of the scope and they shift it up to the magnification they need it to be. Now that eye box will shift right where it needs to be, optimizing the eye relief behind the gun. In doing so, you make your entire system very, very versatile for whatever discipline you're doing and whatever application of the weapon system inside of that discipline. I'm Michael Bocciolieri. Thanks for tuning in.